Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books in Miami, Florida, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Anne McCutcheon to discuss The Life She Wished to Lead, a biography of Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings, author of The Yearling, published by our friends at Norton. And McCutcheon is the author of six works of biography and memoir, including Marcel Moisset, Voice of the Flute, and Where's the Moon, a memoir of the Space Coast and the Florida Dream. The founding director of the University of Wyoming's MFA in Creative Writing program and former editor of American Literary Review, McCutcheon grew up in Florida and now lives in Wyoming. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Bonnie Friedman. Bonnie is the author of the best-selling Writing Past Dark, Envy, Fear, Distraction, and Other Dilemmas in the Writer's Life, named one of the essential books for writing according to the Center for Fiction, and one of the best books for writers according to Poets and Writers. Her work is regularly cited as notable in Best American Essays, and has been included in the best American movie writing, the best writing on writing, and the best spiritual writing. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of The Life She Wished to Lead or any other book from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Welcome, welcome. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Hi, I am. So I'm Bonnie Friedman, and Anne and I are, are old friends and colleagues. We taught together at the University of North Texas. And I wanted to start off by by saying, Anne, how thrilled I was earlier this week by this rave review in the New York Times, like just a glorious review. There's a picture of the author we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I was thinking, Anne, that what we could do tonight is talk about Marjorie's evolution as an artist, hmm. the different changes that she went through, and that that might be inspiring for the artists and writers out there to see how do you, I love the theme that you chose of your book, The Life She Wished to Live, because she lived at a time when there was a lot of sexism and there were a lot of obstacles to, to uh, women getting respect as artists, so I thought that could be our theme for this evening. But just to introduce Marjorie Rawlings, and then we're going to turn it over to you with my first question, but I thought, you know, there might be some viewers today that don't know Marjorie. So I was going to quote from Dwight Garner's New York Times review where he described her. He said, it's a pleasure to meet this cursing, hard drinking, brilliant, self-destructive, car wrecking, fun loving, chain smoking, alligator hunting, moonshine making, food obsessed woman. That's Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings. And then I was also tickled because a, a, a writer wrote in, a reader of the Times wrote in, and she said that uh, she uses Marjorie Rawlings' collard greens recipe for veggies on Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. And I thought, that, I thought that really captured how fond people are in Florida of, of her. Yes. Um, she won the Pulitzer in 1939 for her second novel, The Yearling. She was born in D.C., educated in... Um, uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison, and um, and then at a certain point in her life, sight unseen, she um, bought an orange grove in Florida, and 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 wrote from there. So I don't know if you would want to. Is there anything you want to say to introduce her, and then maybe read a little tiny bit to give us a sense of her voice, and then we'll get into the questions. Um, sure. Um why don't I read, do, read a little bit from The Yearling, just a few paragraphs to give you an idea of her prose. Um, that is one of the things that, that um, attracted me to her. Uh, um, my fourth grade teacher read The Yearling aloud to my class in, in Pompano Beach, Florida. And it's been since then, all, all these years, that that, uh, <clears throat> that voice on the page has haunted me. So 
Let me do that. Let me put Marjorie first, and then and then I'll I'll speak for myself. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, this is a scene from The Yearling when uh, Jody and his his father, um, Henny Baxter, are hunt or uh, they've been hunting and fishing, and they're out in the in the hammock in the swamp. And they're fishing, and suddenly they see some birds. and um, And here's the passage. Jody saw the great white birds in the distance. His father's eye, he thought, was like an eagle's. They crouched on all fours and crept forward slowly. Now and then, Penny dropped flat on his stomach and Jody dropped behind him. They reached a clump of high sawgrass and Penny motioned for concealment behind it. The birds were so close that it seemed to Jody he might touch them with his long fishing pole. Penny squatted on his haunches and Jody followed. His eyes were wide. He made a count of the whooping cranes. There were 16. The cranes were dancing a cotillion as surely as it was danced at Volusia. Two stood apart, erect and white, making a strange music that was part cry and part singing. The rhythm was irregular like the dance. The other birds were in a circle. In the heart of the circle, several moved counterclockwise. The musicians made their music. The dancers raised their wings and lifted their feet, first one and then the other. They sunk their heads deep in their snowy breasts, lifted them and sunk again. They moved soundlessly, part awkwardness, part grace. The dance was solemn. Wings fluttered, rising and falling like outstretched arms. The outer circle shuffled around and around. The group in the center attained a slow frenzy. Suddenly, all motion ceased. Jody thought the dance was over or that the intruders had been discovered. Then the two musicians joined the circle. Two others took their places. There was a pause. The dance was resumed. The birds were reflected in the clear marsh water. Sixteen white shadows reflected the motions. The evening breeze moved across the sawgrass. It bowed and fluttered. The water rippled. The setting sun lay rosy on the white bodies. Magic birds were dancing in a mystic marsh. The grass swayed with them and the shallow waters and the earth fluttered under them. The earth was dancing with the cranes and the low sun and the wind and the sky. Jody found his own arms lifting and falling with his breath as the crane's wings lifted. The sun was sinking into the sawgrass. The marsh was golden. The whooping cranes were washed with gold. The far hammocks were black. Darkness came to the lily pads and the water blackened. The cranes were whiter than any clouds or any white bloom of oleander or of lily. Without warning, they took flight. Whether the hour-long dance was simply done or whether the long nose of an alligator had lifted above the water to alarm them, Jody could not tell, but they were gone. They made a great circle against the sunset, whooping their strange rusty cry that sounded only in their flight. Then they flew in a long line into the west and vanished. <clears throat> well, that was gorgeous. You know, as you were reading, Anne, I was thinking that really showcases her great powers of observation. Yes. And, you know, I was wondering before we talk about her life story, if you could reveal to us a little bit about the way she did her research, because I, I know from reading you that um, her strongest work had a great sense of place. Yes. And that she really, and, and that she, like Zora Neale Hurston, had a great ear. And could you talk to us about how she researched, how she came to the sweet place and did her research and gathered material for her fiction? Okay. Um, she did have, um, she, she had a, a, a brief journalism career before going to Florida. And um, as we know, in journalism, we're um, trained or, or we learn to, uh, to find stuff out, you know, to dig deep. And, uh, and that might have been good preparation uh, for her time in Florida. But she was curious anyway, and extremely intelligent. So um, uh, maybe she didn't need to, need to do the journalism, whatever. She got there, she interviewed many, many people. She was in, in a new environment for, for her. She was a city lady who'd con gone to a very small hamlet in central Florida with kinds of people and um, lifestyle mores that, that she was not familiar with. But she made friends and she went about <clears throat> um, interviewing people with her reporter's pad, taking notes. Um, no 
um, tape recorders then. <laughs> so she took um, many, many notes and went again and again to meet with, sometimes live with families in, in, the, um, in the scrub in central Florida to, to be part of the family, to see what their ways and means were. You know, how, how you bake a pound cake in the middle of uh, the hammock, um, how, how, you, how you fish and how you clean a fish. Um, all of these things, she learned all of the practical ways of life in the place she had adopted as home. Um, and in, in addition, she did the book work one needs to know, for example, what are the, um, the rules for fishing in Central Florida? How do you get a fishing license? I mean, all of these things um, she went deeply into so that there was such authenticity to, to her work. She was writing not about that world, but out of that world is the way I like to say it. She was in it. She wrote from it. Could, could you say just a little bit more about the kinds of people that she met there who interested her? They, they were mostly... Um, uh, crackers, um, what, what we call crackers, um, uh, poor uh, or middling um, white settlers um, in that part of Florida. North Central Florida was um, you know, an, an area where many of them settled. They were, they were descended from uh, Southerners, perhaps from other states, Georgia, Alabama. A lot of people came down into Florida uh, from, from those states, from those areas. It's very much like it. Um, the, North Florida is a lot like South Georgia. So um, it's, a, it's a natural, if you want to make a move to a familiar place, you come on down, at least to that part of Florida. Um, so yeah, they were, they were people of, um, of the land. They were people of, of um, making ends meet. You know. Were they the kind of people she was familiar with from her own background? No, not in the least. She, um, she grew up in Washington, D.C. She was born in Washington, D.C. Um, she grew up going to a public school, um, a very, some very good public schools. Her, her father worked in the patent office um, in, in Washington. Her mother was a sort of a social climber. Um, and, and, and they had a, a big, beautiful uh, Victorian house um, in, in, the, in a new suburb called Brooklyn. So no, they were... You know, her, there were tea parties. There. She was um, dressed against her will in frilly dresses, <laughs> little Marjorie. Uh, so, um, no, yeah, it's not at all. <laughs> you know, one of the things I find interesting, because some of us go to a new area and we don't really feel entitled to write about the people in that area. We think, oh, I'm an outsider. It's yes. really not my story. And one of one of the many things that impressed me about her is that she came to this new place and she used the all of this uh, new um, experiences to reach something within herself that she hadn't been able to reach before. Um, you know, so I wanted to go going back before she went to Florida to um, to talk a little bit about her youth, which when I was reading it reminded me a lot of Sylvia Plath and that she wanted very much to place in magazines these mm -hmm. prize-winning stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and very ambitious, the way Plath was ambitious, submitting for prizes and often uh, winning them. So would you, would you talk a little bit about what her writing meant to her as a girl, and maybe even also her relationship to her mother vis-a-vis -vis her writing? Okay. Um, well, her mother... Um, hoped for a splendid daughter who would, uh, would be very talented and, and make a mark in the world and, and marry well. And um, there was emphasis on, um, you know, having beautiful clothes one day, that, that sort of dream for her daughter. And, and uh, the way Marjorie told it, um, her mother first thought perhaps she would be a singer. Um, what, what a nice feminine uh, <laughs> profession to be, say, an opera singer. Or, um, and that didn't work. Um, she, she was deemed not talented. And then uh, almost by accident, she saw a, an ad in, in the newspaper for a children's uh, story contest. And, and she saw a winning story. And, and she wrote one just very similar to it and turned it in. And this is for the Washington Post. And she so she started sending this stuff in, and her mother was encouraging her. And uh, her her writing as a 
young girls say starting from 12 and into her teens was very flowery and uh, lots of adverbs and adjectives and um, and very sweet. And her mother encouraged this and she was, you know, she won contests with it. She wrote some poems as well. Um, she got to the University of Wisconsin to major in English and she uh, was immediately uh, struck down by an instructor or two for this flowery, you know, gooey writing that she'd been praised for. And her, her writing got, um, and it got cleaned up, shall we say, not so sentimental and, and blossomy. Um, her mother was upset about that. How can they say your writing is so bad? And uh, how, what do they know? I know everything. But anyhow, she her writing improved. She wanted to be a poet, most of all, when she was in college. She wrote a lot of poems. Um, I think Edna St. Vincent Millay was um, in, uh, someone she admired in there in those days and later. Um, so there she went um, cleaning up things as a college student and uh, and then she went to New York. Shall I keep going with this? Well, you know what, I, I just, yes, it's very interesting to me. You know, one of the things that I thought was notable is to be, to have to sacrifice the thing for which you were given praise early on as a writer Yes, in order to reach something more difficult and um, and worthwhile to oneself, because in you know here she was doing what what the outer she was getting published. I mean, mm -hmm. would you would you talk about that? Because um, to me, that when I heard the story, that's what I was thinking about: how hard that is to give up what gets you an audience and what gets you praise, but isn't really what you want to be doing. True, and and she was young when when these uh, sentimental stories were were accepted. And that was the kind of thing that, that the newspapers or the little magazines wanted. There was a McCall's short story contest for young writers that she won. But that's the kind of thing um, they, they wanted to run. It's also the kind of thing that ladies would read, if you say McCall's, um, ladies at the time. Um, so yes, that got her published. And I suppose there's a high prize uh, put on being published anywhere, um, and and so she, she that's where she went. But when she got to uh, the University of Wisconsin and had these professors that knocked her down for you know kind of childish writing, it, it was writing for children, writing praised uh, for its childishness. She you know, changed. <laughs> when when I think of her and reading your biography, it's so fascinating. She reminds me also of Edith Wharton and having Edith Wharton's mother uh, was also a society dame. She didn't need to be a social climber because she was at the peak of um, of high high society. But she did yeah. not want a daughter to become an artist. And I had the sense that with Marjorie, there was a, a little bit of that same um, that same tension. So yeah. you know. Um, Talk to us about how she came to what her idea was in buying an orange grove. Talk to us about that. All right. Um, she and her first husband, Charles Rawlings, Chuck, um, had been freelancing in New York. Um, she she is a writer, as a publicist. Um, again, writing um, you know a sort of um, common copy, as, as you would say, hack writing. You know, I've done it. Uh, uh, you know. We've all done it, <laughs> um, and and she went to uh, they they jumped around. They went to Louisville, Kentucky. Then they went back to to Rochester, New York, where his family was, and neither one of them was happy um, freelancing. And they could just see that if they got on the staff of a newspaper, they would just uh, you know they would be they would be nowhere. They would not they would not grow as artists. Both of them were um, wanted to be artists. So uh, around that time. This is in, in the 1920s, mid, mid to late 20s. Uh, Marjorie's mother died, and she inherited some, some money. Um, just enough money to do something crazy that she wanted to do. <laughs> and uh, she and her husband had visited Florida. He had two brothers down there. They thought it was great. They'd gone hunting and fishing there. And they went back to Rochester, and she lost a particular freelance job. And she said, what the hell? Let's just go. And these brothers helped find a piece of land they'd never seen and went sight unseen, 
they jumped off a diving board into central Florida to that. And did she really think she was, she, so her idea was she was going to, the, the, this, this orange grove was going to produce enough money to support her while she had the solitude to write. Is that what? Oh yeah. Very, very naive. Oh, we're just going to sit and write all day and sell oranges. Um, but what did they know? Nothing. They, they got there and the, the farm was a, a wreck and the, the house was barely livable, the farmhouse. The trees needed uh, pruning and you know, all kinds of care. So they worked very hard when they first got there, hard physical labor. And, and, and how, how did she get along with the people who, talk, talk about who she employed to help her out there. Okay, she, she employed some, some, neighbor, some neighbors helped without pay, pitched in. Um, she employed others. Um, some some were white, some were black. This is a, a community of uh, a hamlet with with um, both black and white, and kind of s scattered around in, in in the woods. And so she, they had help from uh, various people there. Some paid, some unpaid, depending. Right, right. Um, so you know. I was wondering another thing that was very interesting to me is that she had two she had two different husbands. The first husband, um, it seemed like a great match. He was also a writer. I remember when she met him, she was a college student, and she said when she'd spoken to him, it was as if she'd known him all her life. And a friend said he was the core to her puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and he actually told her mother, "You've got her writing the things you want." Rather, you know, she was a great defender of that. Yeah. Um, and then her second husband was quite different. And that's interesting, the idea of the, the right partner for an ambitious artist to have. And I'm wondering if you could talk what went wrong in the first marriage, what was right about it, and ditto the second marriage. Sure, um, be glad to. Um, yeah, Chuck, Chuck was ambitious himself. He was, he was a good writer. Um, and so they, they met at a time when they were both about to go into the real world and and you know, make their mark as writers. They were both very ambitious. Um, Marjorie was quite confident in herself. Chuck, not so much. And uh, many times in, in letters to her, he'd say, I'm not as good as you are. You know, you're, I don't know where you get your strength. And she would say, oh, I need you to lean on, you know, the, you know that, that dance that, that can happen. Um, when they got to Cross Creek, they were both working very hard. They both had the same dream for the place. But what happened was that um, Marjorie was successful as a writer very soon. Um, they got there in 1928. Very shortly, she'd written some sketches um, based on experiences with cracker folk there, um, really some of their own stories. And that led her to um, uh, Max Perkins at Scribner and her first novel, South Moon Under, uh, published in 1933, which was considered for a Pulitzer. Right, it's a wonderful book. And Chuck, Chuck couldn't take it in, in so many words. It was just too hard. So he left. They divorced and he left. The second marriage uh, to Norton Baskin was quite different. Was some years later, although she met him right away after her divorce, and they were, uh, close for a long time before they actually married. And he was a hotel man. He, he ran a hotel in Ocala, which was pretty close to Cross Creek, and then later to St. Augustine. He went, and he was he was the life of the party. He'd pour your drinks. He'd, you know, talk you up. And he was the man who walked around in the hotel dining room, made sure everybody was okay, and uh, a delight, great wit. They got along famously. He and Marjorie. There was no competition, and he um, he respected her her the, her need for time. Um, if she needed to go away for two months to North Carolina and write, fine. He'd drive her up there, drive her up there with her cats and dog, come back and pick her up uh, at the end of the summer, that sort of thing. And uh, one could say that for some years their marriage was long distance in a sense that she would be at the creek writing during the week while he was at the hotel working and then they would get together on the weekends. That is one reason why there's so many letters between them because even though they were part, they wrote constantly to each other. Wow, that's so, it's really interesting for, for us who are working artists 
to mm-hmm. hear about, you know, that first match that she had was, a, I, I had the sense was a great love and she felt a great, a great uh, affinity with him. But, yes. it's, but, but, you know, for ego reasons, it didn't work out. I could see it would be difficult to, to live with somebody in your same field who is exceeding you. And mm-hmm. I remember that same thing. I was telling you this afternoon, the same thing happened to Edna O'Brien when she had literary success. Her, she, her marriage fell apart. The guy could not handle it. So it's very interesting. I have friends who talk about who gets to be the star in the marriage. And, <laughs> and I guess in, in Marjorie's second marriage, it was uh, Marjorie. Um, right. But, you know, let me ask you, I know that um, Marjorie had a very famous editor who was the yes. same editor that um, Hemingway had and Thomas Wolfe had. And would, would you talk about her, uh, her, how did she get to have this editor? And what was their working relationship like? What did he bring for her? Well, she had sent uh, and published some sketches of Cracker People, Cracker Life, with Scribner's Magazine. And then she entered a contest that Scribner's had um, offered. And, uh, and Maxwell Perkins read her work and, and discovered her, if you will, and invited her to, have you ever thought of writing a novel? Um, I would love to know about it. Uh, in his very gentlemanly way, um, brought her into the fold and encouraged her. And so for, I believe it's 17 years, that relationship between editor and author flourished until his death. Um, he, uh, the correspondence between them is, is wonderful. So it's a story in itself. Um, and it's published uh, in, in a book, Max and Marjorie, that uh, Roger Tarr, a, a wonderful scholar of, of Rawlings, um, assembled. Um, he, he had a gift for anticipating writers' moods or what they needed to hear. Um, he could give specific instructions for, say, creating a character or filling in a gap that perhaps the, the writer had not noticed had been left. Little things that, that um, we might not notice when we're in a first draft. Um, he would send her detailed letters saying, what about this? I don't quite get that. Might we try this? Might you consider never telling her you do this, but suggestion, the power of suggestion and his intuition um, uh, for, for each writer's um, best writing. That's, that was his goal. You know, one of the things that comes up in your book is that um, he, I believe, suggested the idea of her writing a book for boys. Yes. And that's how the yearly, it's always very interesting. What is the genesis of a great work? And mm-hmm. I was impressed reading, is that, could you talk about that? How did the yearling come about? Yes. Um, she, she wrote and published South Moon Under and had another book, um, her second novel, Golden Apples, um, in, in the works. And I've forgotten exactly what year, but it was in that, you know, South Moon under Golden Apples uh, time when he gently suggested in, in a letter, might you consider writing about a, a boy in, in the scrub? Um, just a, a young boy in the scrub. And he didn't say any more than that. It was not a children's book. He, he was not looking for that, but a novel that had at the center of it a young a young boy. And so she said, yes, uh, sure, um, yeah, I'll put that aside. And, and she kept working on whatever she was working on. She, she had met um, a man in, uh, in the scrub who'd had an experience having to, I guess I'll give it away, <laughs> have to, having to shoot his beloved pet fawn when he was about that same age. That is what the book leads to. It's a coming of age story. So she had that story, she had some others, and finally she sat down uh, after Golden Apples was finished and, and started The Yearling. So it came from Max more than from Marjorie, although she had stories, to t- she had material for it. Right, I, I, re- I remember being very impressed by that, that she had this, once he proposed writing about a boy, mm-hmm. she was able to access these memories, and I think she, inter- she interviewed Yes. This man who um, who uh, had that experience, mm-hmm. and am I right? She she I, I remember reading in you that she uh, you know 
She had to research how do you do a bear hunt. There were all kinds of things in this boy's life in the scrub that yes. she had to, is that, could you talk about, like what is the kind of research that she would have done for the yearling? It, it was not all interviews. She was, she, she asked to be taken out on a bear hunt. She would ask to be taken on a rattlesnake roundup, whatever she needed. Um, this was a raw place, it still is, <laughs> raw central Florida. Um, how can you write about a place like that if you don't really live in it? If it's not, way of life is not embedded in you somehow. So she, um, she hunted, she fished, she, uh, anything she needed to, to learn, um, you know, to, to, to write that way of life. She had to, it had to be in her bones. Right, there's a great picture in, in your book of, of her spearing, going out at night to spear, what is it, crabs? And she, yeah. with a harpoon-like thing that, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, let me ask you, what, what do you think, it's so interesting to me that she was able to find the, the, her voice writing about a very strange, different world. I'm wondering if you could talk about, what do you find so important and singular in her work? Um, I would want to go back to um, a piece she wrote in the 1920s when she was basically out of work. She had, um, she had quit a good feature writing job in, in Rochester because her husband was jealous of her editor. And her husband was a traveling salesman at that time, uh, Chuck, and imagined that Marjorie was having an affair with her editor. And finally, she just said, Oh, okay, I'll quit. If it'll make you, you know, happy, I'll quit. So she was for two or three years in Rochester. She had little to do, um, and so she started writing um, stories. And I came across one, the beginning of one story written during that time that had the voice of the writer of the Yearling of South Moon Under um, it was set in Michigan farmland. Um, her her grandparents and parents, a mother's um, home. But it, it, it just popped out at me. It was like all of a sudden this cacophony of you know, sound that was her, her, her writing, her paid writing, let's say, you know, paid for certain audiences, um, became smooth and calm and beautiful flowing sentences like the ones I just read. And I saw that scrap and I thought it was there all along. She was practicing it there when she had nothing else to do. So when she gets to Florida, it's not as if that voice just came out of nowhere. It was, it had been there. And here was a place that invited her to, to write, to, to research and so much came together there. It, it's very interesting because, you know, she has such a lyrical voice and she takes her time on the page, even yes, though I know, as many writers, she has a, she had a background in drama. I know she did some acting, which I think mm -hmm. is is uh, useful for, for fiction writers. I'm surprised by the number of fiction writers I know that spend some time on the stage. Um, yeah. Let me remind uh, people who are watching, if you have any questions, we're about to turn to questions, so you can put it into the chat, and I'll I'll read some questions to to um, to Anne. Um, there was something else I was going to ask. I'm looking at my notes here. Oh yes. So she became, you write about her friendship with uh, the great novelist Zora Neale Hurston. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about, it was Hurston wrote uh, The Rise We're Watching God and um, Mule Tracks in the Dust. Talk mm -hmm. to us about that friendship too and what, what changes it brought for Marjorie. It, it, was, uh, it was an amazing change. It, I call it a come to Jesus. Everybody must know what that means. Um, she 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 grew up with and um, arrived in Florida with very conventional racist views, and uh, she had um, black servants in her in her farmhouse who um, prepared her breakfast, um, cooked. Now Marjorie was a fantastic cook, and so she was very often in the kitchen with you know with these women. So um, it's not as if she was. Um, sitting on a throne, being served every moment. She she loved to get her, you know, flour on her elbows and you know, and stir the pot. Um, now I've forgotten what I was. <laughs> so, uh, but 
but black citizens there were less than and and always had been in her life um, and so she had the opportunity in 1942 um, to meet Zora in St. Augustine at a historically black school um, and and she was blown away by the, this woman's work, by her intelligence, by the way she carried herself, the, um, everything. And they started talking and, and uh, uh, Marjorie invited her to come have tea with her um, or a drink <laughs> at the hotel that her husband ran. Um, so it's a, it's a a story worth telling again. Um, she went to the hotel, she was, uh, Marjorie did. She alerted her husband. She got nervous. She thought a black woman, a well-dressed black woman coming in the front of her husband's hotel might upset the all white clientele, right? So uh, Norton Baskin got one of his assistants to watch out for her in the front door and get her in the hotel as fast as, as he could. Zora, however, foresaw the whole thing. She was used to uh, the way things were. She entered the hotel through the kitchen um, and came up and found the apartment that, uh, that uh, the Baskins shared. And there they, she and, and Marjorie had a whooping good time and, and that's, that's the end of friendship. Um, it was, it, they lived apart. It was not as if they were neighbors. They just, it was a great coincidence that they were in St. Augustine at the same time, but they, they wrote to each other. They helped each other. Um, it, it was, and it changed Marjorie's view of race entirely. Um, she, it took her some time, two years or so to just sort of reorient herself and, um, a person of genius. Yes. No. Yes. And, and then began to see every you know, her, her own staff differently, treat them differently. It, it, uh, and then she became an outspoken um, advocate for civil rights. Yeah, you know, Zora Neale Hurston was a graduate, wasn't she, of Columbia University, and she studied anthropology, and she had, I mean, amazing, you know, yes. you know and world famous writer, just really, so it must have been quite something to meet somebody you don't expect uh, you know, that just shook her up, that that's really interesting. Let me turn to uh, some of the questions that, that people have submitted. I'll read them to you. Um, right. So um, as so, there's a, 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 how long did it take you to write the book is uh, the first question here. <laughs> um, I started, if we're talking about from initial research, like making sure I had read every novel, um, which I hadn't when I started, um, to turning in the final draft um, that would be from um, 2014, uh, about this time in 2014, uh, to the middle of 2019. Uh, and I was working on it full time. I left, I left my teaching job, as you know, to work on that book full time. So it was my job. It was my eight to five job, if you will. And, and, and then there have been two years um, nearly of um, uh, preparing the footnote, the end notes, um, getting permissions to quote. I mean, a lot of technical stuff that has to be done. Um, Those permissions, that's probably a whole nother year of your life. Okay. <laughs> as well as, <laughs> yeah. Here's another question that came in. Um, as you researched the book, was there an aspect of her personality that surprised you that you did not expect? Mm. Uh, Gee, uh, in a way, I expected anything. You know, I I knew enough about her uh, to know that she was a, quite a personality. She had her ups and downs. I I guess I could say there was something I I did ex maybe I expected, but I wish weren't true, and that was that she was a, a drank too much. She's an alcoholic. And I kept wanting her to quit. And every time I just, she'd write in a letter, I'm on, you know, I've quit for good or I'm going off the booze for two weeks. I'd say, oh, maybe this will be. And then we keep reading, go, damn it. She, <laughs> she went back to it and her health suffered for it. She was a delicate person anyway, a delicate constitution. And between um, the alcohol, maybe eating too much fatty foods, which we didn't know about you know, back then. Um, and driving herself, 
she was driven as a writer. Um, it was it was tough. I I, yeah, I wish it had been better for her. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm surprised when you see pictures of her how delicate she is because she did so many rugged things. I was yes. just reading some story in your book about how she woke up during the night and she heard the yowling of a cat a cat up the mountainside and she was just wearing her nightgown and her little silk jacket and her slippers and she went up the mountain that you know uh -huh. that seemed quite typical of her let me take like two more questions it says um as you wrote did you ever feel as if marjorie was reading over your shoulder did you feel as if she was commenting whether she agreed with what you were telling did you feel disapproval which led you to rethink oh that's somebody <laughs> who, I, who understands marjorie's cosmic consciousness <laughs> i love her cosmic consciousness um uh, in fact if if she was looking over my shoulder at all she was making sure that i stressed that 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 was at the the root of her um, her writing um she became enamored of co cosmic consciousness that the concept um early on in college she wrote about it and and it, it drove it there's a, a line through all of her work her mature work um, about the connection interconnection of all living things and and also um the fact that we are often at the mercy of forces that we can't control um we see that in the in the cracker stories for sure um I often got angry with her. Not that she was behind me, but I would say, Marge, why did you, why did you drive 80 miles an hour in, on a, in a dirt road with a drink in your hand? Or Marge, if you would only stop, you know, um, the archivist at, at the University of Florida, uh, who is in charge of Marjorie's papers, uh, it, it, Flo Turcott was a, a great ally through this whole process. And I can't tell you that many times I would text or pick up the phone to Flo and say, oh, Marge, I can't believe she... <laughs> so she became a, <laughs> um, someone I I wanted to do right by, you know, and, and who disappointed me sometimes. But of course, I have, I have to tell the whole story, and I did. Yeah. So. yeah. One thing we didn't get to um, was, which I, people can read about her in the book, the time she was sued for writing about somebody in her small town um, and how ultimately she, and ultimately I think she ended, there was a lot of back and forth, but I love the part of the story where she was, you know, in so in command of the moment that even in the courtroom, she was interrogating the person who was supposed to be interrogating her. Yes. And the lawyer had to be stopped and told, you don't have to answer her questions. She's supposed to answer her questions. <laughs> she was a commanding presence. I mean, go back to the drama days at Wisconsin. Uh, one would not call her a shrinking violet at all. And as she aged, she uh, that, that life young figure um, um, broadened a bit. Um, she was she, she had a salty tongue and she wasn't afraid to use it. Um, she she was quite she's quite something. Yeah, uh, she, very inspiring. Let me see if there is another another question. Um, let's see, um, Anne, are you already planning your next book project? Is there an American literary figure who calls you, or perhaps a luminary from Wyoming? Wow, um, is this a Wyoming person? Uh, Her name is Carol. Let's see, <laughs> is the Wyoming person Carol K. Condit? Okay, um, I'm on the spot, aren't I? Uh, when I finished Marjorie, um, I, I thought, well, what's next? And I'm, I really try to jump the gun too many times, and, and, and so I went down some rabbit holes. Here's a figure, maybe a classical music uh, figure, because I'm a musician. Um, I, what, that was my first career. Um, but this literary figure, I spoke with my agent about, well, who could it be? And we tossed around some names. and. Then I realized it was too soon. It, and now I really know it's too soon <laughs> because I have to spend a while um, getting this book out into the world. It's not enough to complete a book and send it to um, your publisher. It sure isn't. Um, it, the baby's been born and now you, you get it on its feet. So, And this is part of it. You, you owe that. This this book is so, oh my God, what a delight. Isn't that gore? I love that cover. It's, it's just so very, very beautiful. 
We, well, I think we're just about out of t time. I was I was told we should have 35 minutes, so I don't know if you know if there's anything you. I guess I'll I'll ask I'll answer end with one last question, Anne, because the theme I wanted to develop was about the evolution of an artist. If you were going to say a takeaway for developing writers that you see in Marjorie's life, what would it be? Or write what you want to write. Don't sacrifice uh, what your your voice, your own, your own message. Early in uh, her New York career, an editor said to Marjorie, um, "You must have." a message or something you deeply want to express to be a fine writer. And for Marjorie, that was the cosmic consciousness concept kind of drove um, you know, her, her writing, her, her mature writing. And so I would say that um, don't, don't write to the market. This is what she did when she started. I mean, she had to earn money to, to live by writing for the market. But once she could step back, and reassess and had the opportunity had had her life in her you know con, under her own control she wrote what she wanted and she drove herself to write as well as she could that was it and, and look what a legacy she she left yes so yeah. you know um there's so much more to talk about i loved that you know you mentioned she was a great cook and i love all the strange crazy things that she alligator and bear and paws i don't know what endangered birds endangered, <laughs> endangered birds but anyway thank you so much just you know a fascinating book fascinating uh, conversation thank you ann thank you bonnie Thank great. you both. That was just wonderful. So, so would you say that she did live the life that she wished to live? Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us in our virtual bookshop. And I just want to remind everyone watching everywhere that you can order your copy of the book if you don't already have it. I saw someone commenting, I just ordered my copy today. Can't wait to read it. All you need to do is just press the green button at the bottom of the screen and we'll ship it right off to you. And just thank you again for, for sharing this time with us and with all of our viewers everywhere. And, and thanks for watching. Um, and we'll see you again. And good luck as you embark on this journey of you know, <laughs> propping up the book. It's, it's not easy, it's not easy. And Bonnie, it's such a pleasure to meet you and know about your work too. Thanks. Um, She's Just great. wonderful. <laughs> so I hope we'll see you again. Maybe in Miami. <laughs> Maybe in November. Maybe for Miami Book Fair. I would love it. <laughs> okay. okay. Be well, everybody. Thank you.